we will hear from Dr. Brendan Cullen and Dr. Paul Cheng from the University of Melbourne. Um, Dr. Brendan Cullen is a senior lecturer in grazing systems at the University of Melbourne, and he is responsible together with Paul, who's a lecturer in livestock nutrition and grazing management um, of the operation and the research that is conducted at Dookie Dairy Campus. So, Brendan and Paul are the first of the Australian speakers with us here today, and I believe Brendan is the first speaker um, today. All right. Morning, everyone. Can you see and hear me? See the presentation? We can see the presentation. We can hear you perfectly fine. Okay, beautiful. All right. Well, uh, thanks, everyone, for um, the opportunity to to talk with you all today. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about pasture-based AMS, in particular the experience we've had with our um, farm, dairy farm in Northern Victoria. So I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes or so, then hand over to Paul, um, who's going to talk about um, some of the work we've done around heat stress uh, as well. Um, so um, let me see if I can flick this on. So. Um, I guess, you know, at, at the University of Melbourne, we're kind of newcomers to automatic milking systems and the group in at the University of Sydney with Kendra Kerrix when she was still there, Nico, Yani have done a lot of work in the development of automatic milking systems through the future dairy projects. Um, so I'm not going to go through much of that background, but just focus on our farm system and the kind of work we're doing there. But just as a, a bit of a snapshot, um, there's around 5,200, depending on what data set you look at, 5,200 dairy farms in Australia and somewhere around 50 um, farms with automatic milking systems. Um, the vast majority of those farms are, have pasture-based production systems and that's where a lot of the work um, which Future Dairy has done is around how you integrate um, automatic milking systems into um, pasture-based production systems. Um, our farm, um, the Dookie farm, is located um, in northern Victoria. So I've got a map there um, showing the major dairy regions. So most of the dairy production is concentrated in the southeastern corner of, of Australia, of, um, Australia um, in our probably more high rainfall um, and coastal production zones. Um, and within Victoria, the Dookie Dairy is located in, in this northern part of Victoria. Um, uh, so I guess the characteristic environment of northern Victoria contrasting with the more southern Victorian regions is that it's a, a much drier um, area and, and it relies on irrigated pasture. Um, so irrigated water from the river systems um, is an essential part of the historical farm systems, but I think this, this region, particularly in Northern Victoria, is one which is really um, under challenge um, due to the changing climate and changing dynamics of the dairy industry over the last uh, couple of decades. So um, in particular, some of those challenges are around the high costs um, of water and feed. Um, so irrigated systems um, relying a lot on irrigation water and with low rainfall that we've experienced across the region. Um, so low inflow into dams and also um, increasing competition for, for water for, from other industries like horticulture and for environmental purposes um, has led to high cost of irrigation water. Um, also high feed costs, so purchase feed costs like um, grain and other supplementary feeds. Um, heat stress is another major challenge um, in this area. So particularly through summer days, it's very common to have, um, you know, maximum temperatures in the mid 30s, mid 30, 35 degrees and above and um, maximum temperatures into the low to mid uh, 40 degrees um, as well in, in Celsius. So heat stress is a major impact for probably about uh, four or five months of the year. What we also see in this region is a real transition going on. So we talk about the Australian dairy industry being a pasture-based industry, 
but in this region in particular, as a result of those challenges around water price and, and feed costs, there's a there's a transition going on and, and a lot of interest in moving towards more intensive systems. So grazing pastures becoming less uh, part of the diet um, and a move, a lot of people looking at and moving into more intensive systems. So having feed pads, feeding partial mixed rations for part of the years and also going to housed um, systems and total mixed ration systems. So there's a lot of change going on um, and kind of interested in how that change occurs and also how automatic milking systems might fit into that and it's pretty unclear at, at the moment. So the Dookie Dairy, um, the, our farm in Northern Victoria, um, we've got about 120 hectares in total. About um, There's about a grazing area of pasture, irrigated pastures of about 55 hectares. Um, and that's split up into a three-way uh, grazing system. So on the figure on your right-hand side there, you can see the dairy marked in the middle, um, and we've got three, three grazing zones. Um, so zone A on the, on the right-hand side there, which also extends a bit further out, and, and as we've expanded over the last couple of years into some areas of pasture a bit further over to the right-hand side, uh, zone B and zone C. So we have that three-way grazing system set up, um, and cows move voluntarily around that system. Um, we have a split calving herd um, of up to about 160 um, Holstein Frisian cows. Um, those, um, the split is probably around 60% um, calving in the autumn time and around 40% calving in the, oh, sorry, 60% in springtime and 40% in autumn. So we're milking um, all year round. And the automatic milking system was installed there in 2014. Uh, so three Laley astronaut A4 robots um, were installed in 2014 on the farm. And previously to that, there was a herring, herringbone dairy installed there. Um, so um, as a both a teaching and, and research organization, um, the certainly the uh, the robotic system has generated a huge amount of interest through our, through our teaching, both into undergraduate and postgraduate um, uh, courses. And it's been, um, you know, a real great lead in to get people interested in the technology, but then also talk about, you know, the fundamental uh, way that um, dairy farm systems are managed. Um, feed base on the farm. Uh, so we grow mostly annual pastures now. Um, so because of the high cost of water, we don't irrigate through the summertime. So we grow annual pastures and irrigate them on the shoulders of the seasons uh, mostly. Um, so annual pastures in the diet from about um, April through to um, November, um, along with um, concentrate feed being fed while the cows are being milked. Um, and then over the summertime, without pasture in the diet, the um, the diet uh, the um, the diet for the herd is is mainly um, hay and silage fed on the feed pad or a little bit in the paddock, um, and and concentrate in the diet. So it's probably around a third, a third, a third. So a third concentrate feed, uh, up to probably around two tons a year, depending on the price of feed. Um, about around two tonnes per cow grazed pasture, uh, maybe slightly more than that, and about two tonnes of, of hay and silage um, over the course of a year. Uh, so what I want to do now is talk about some of the research projects that we've uh, been doing. And in particular, we've been interested in um, milking order. Um, so we have the voluntary uh, movement system here. Uh, so it's been a fair bit of research go on about understanding uh, milking order in conventional milk dairies. And we see this consistent um, pattern of milking order with early cows um, and late cows. And so we've been investigating what that looks like in terms of uh, voluntary milking systems. Um, so the way we've used the automatic milking system is at Dookie is every time we come in, the cows come in uh, to be milked, um, we have a timestamp. 
Um, so the date and time stamp of each, each milking event. Um, and we've used those milking uh, times to, to look at um, the order at which cows uh, come in. Um, so this work that I'm going to talk about was we looked monthly um, over the period from August 2017 to April 2018, um, looking at those uh, milking times um, on, a, on a monthly basis. So the graph we're looking at here is the percentile rank. So when the cows come in, we rank um, the order at which they come in. Um, and that is mean percentile rank is the average um, over the month. Um, and this is from the month of November 2017. So the average rank um, and also the, the variability in their rank. So um, low variability means they were consistent. Um, high variability means they were um, moved changed rank quite a bit through the year. So one of the notable things that we see in this in this analysis is, is these late cows. So we have a, a group of cows which are consistently uh, late in the in the milking order. Um, so they're always the ones that are coming in towards towards the end. Um, and to a lesser extent we see a group of early cows. So probably not quite as um, not quite as consistent as the late cows, but a group of cows which tend to have um, early average ranks and also lower variability. And through the middle of the through the middle of the herd we see um, a tendency for higher variability. Um, so the cows move around in their order quite a bit um, through the middle of the herd. Um, so we also see, so this was for one month, we also see that there's a quite a consistency through time. So in consecutive months, so looking at um, individual cows percentile rank position in November and comparing that to December, we see there's quite a, a consistency though. So the cows that had a low percentile rank were our early cows in November also tended to be early um, in, in December. Um, and same is true for the for the late cows as well. Um, so we can see consistency from month to month, but if you look at that over longer time periods, so if you look at it over a three or four uh, month period, then that, that consistency uh, tends to decline. But from one month to the next, it's, it's pretty high. Um, early cows in those early cows tend to be high producing cows as well. So we noticed that um, in the data set. Um, so those early cows tend to be on average, um, have a, about a four and a half kilograms per day greater milk production than cows uh, towards the end of the herd. Uh, but what we've also noticed in the data set is that the difference in milk production between the early cows and the late cows was smaller um, and non-significant when there was little grazed pasture in the diet. So between January and March, when there's not a lot of um, pasture available, um, there wasn't a, as big a difference. Um, in addition to, uh, to milking order, those early cows, so in addition to their differences in milk production, um, the early cows tend to be earlier in lactation, so less days in milk. Um, which is also going to influence their milk production. Um, and the early cows tend to be the multi parous cows. So the, the um, heifers tend to be more towards that, that uh, late group of cows in the herd. So what we were interested in is um, we can see some of the characteristics, but we're also interested in pasture. Um, so how early and late cows access pasture, uh, the the amount of pasture that they um, access and the quality of that pasture and how that might influence um, their milk production characteristics. So we've done some work on selected dates, looking at the mass of pasture um, when the cows come in. So um, on the x-axis here, we've got time since the first cow entry. So this, is, this work was done um, in the morning milking session. So um, about first light here um, is zero when the first cows start to come through the um, AMS system and, and enter the paddock. Um, and then we've got around five hours, five to six hours, um, but, uh, while the whole herd is milked and then the late cows uh, come in um, over on the right hand side of the graph. 
So the early cows are coming into these paddocks when the pasture mass is around three and a half to 4,000 kilograms dry matter per hectare. Um, and the pasture's been grazed down um, and late cows are coming in. By the time they're coming in, you know, the pasture's been depleted down to kind of two to two and a half uh, tonnes of dry matter per hectare. So the early cows are certainly able to uh, maximise um, their pasture intake um, for, for a higher pasture mass. Um, there's also some difference in, in nutritive characteristics as well. Uh, so particularly for crude protein. Uh, so uh, the early cows are able to select a diet of higher quality. So what we did here was we tried to select um, parts of the pasture that the cows were consuming um, early in the, in, in the period. So we get quite a strong gradient of crude protein decline through time as the cows are selecting you know, the, the leafy material um, and that declines through time as the cows are selecting more stemmy material. Um, and we, but we didn't see quite as big a difference um, across the grazing cycle for difference in metabolizable energy content. So not as much, so uh, maybe perhaps a small decline in metabolizable energy content of the pastures that those early and late cows are selected. I think one of the reasons for that is we did this early in the morning. So the water soluble carbohydrate content of the plants is, is increasing quite rapidly um, from, from when the sun comes up uh, through this, this period as well. Uh, but we can see a trend there. So those early cows are coming in, uh, they got access to higher pasture mass and also a little bit more um, uh, higher nutritive characteristics of the pasture as well. And so we're at the moment trying to do some modeling to understand what that difference in pasture mass um, and quality means in terms of uh, milk production to try and understand what the potential benefits uh, would be in terms of um, organizing grazing management so that we could give those later cows access, perhaps give those later cows access to fresh pasture if that financially viable. Um, what we also, I guess one of the things um, we tried to look at is how could we predict a milking order and the cow characteristics, so um, production, live weight alone, those characteristics were poor predictors of milking order. So there's also some aspects of, you know, social hierarchy that we need to consider in the herd as well. Um, also, just leading on from AMS and another project I'm working in, there's a lot of interest in, in grazing management and using new technologies like virtual herding. So those sorts of tools where we can actually even out access to pasture across the herd. So if we could use tools like that to preferentially graze those late cows or, or move them out of paddocks um, without having to go and fetch them, we see quite some significant benefits of integrating kind of newer technologies um, into AMS systems as well. All right, I'll leave it there, uh, Nico, and... Perfect, thank you, Brendan, for that one. Probably uh, what I suggest doing is we'll move to Paul and we can tackle questions at the end. Do you agree with that? Sure. All right, perfect. I'll make a start and uh, uh, I'll, I'll quickly run through the the background information and hopefully we'll still get a few more minutes to, to, to have a question and answer session, right? Uh, so what we're looking at here is a study completed by a master student, uh, Yijing, who was interested in to look at the stages of lactation, interaction with heat stress, and try to understand what would be the impact on the cow performance in an automatic milking system. Uh, Collaborators, uh, including Brennan and uh, Frank Dangshe and Dong Wen Luo from Ag Research in New Zealand, who is a statistician, helped us to analyze the data. Oops. All right. So a bit of background, as I said very quickly, probably most of you would know this anyway. Uh, heat stress rarely defines as when a particular animal, a group of animal, or group of animal actually heat low is greater than its capacity to lose heat. Uh, the impact of heat stress uh, is not just about to reduce the feed intake, but uh, leading into a greater nutritional and energy requirement. Uh, 
And also, there are some evidence basically uh, shows us there's a potential to reduce fertility. Milk production drop definitely and probably change in milk quality. Uh, milk production drop is very much depending on how bad the heat stress is and how, how bad the animal actually suffer. We are talking about somewhere between 10 to 50 percent magnitude. Um, increased frequency of health related issues. These are uh, more of a probably a welfare uh, issue uh, these days in Australia because people are very conscious about how would heat stress actually impact on animal health. Uh, a simple analysis uh, from uh, Dairy Australia basically showed heat stress in Australia for an average farm with 100 cows per year mm -hmm. would cost the farm around about $10,000, which is a big cost if you think about a particular farm running 1,000 cows. In this case, would be $100,000 loss of profit. Uh, looking at this map here, as Brendan already mentioned, that uh, the majority milk production region, region in Australia is in uh, Victoria, which is down south here, and uh, probably the southern part of uh, New South Wales. Uh, this picture here basically shows that what if uh, the um, temperature increased by 2.7 percent. What is the scenario of that? Uh, what this really shows us, for example, in the region of uh, uh, southern Australia, Victoria, in this particular case, uh, what we're looking at is uh, increasing the heat uh, stress 2.7 percent, or the, sorry, the 2.7 percent uh, temperature increase will lead to about probably 20 percent more heat stress compared with the first scenario, which is you know 2.7 uh, percent temperature less. What we're showing here, the percentage is actually a percentage of day with heat stress that the cattle would suffer. So very substantial increase of heat stress um, uh, to the animal if the temperature increase by around about 2.7 degrees C. In, north, uh, in southern part of Australia, uh, Traditionally, it's a seasonal calving system, which basically we are allowed to calve in spring period. However, the split calving system is increasingly adopted in Australia, particularly in the southern part of Australia, due to adverse climate conditions. Mostly talking about climate change, more heat stress, you know, short of fade, drought, etc., which actually leads to reduced conception rate in spring calving system. However, uh, while the farmers are moving towards to the split calving system, there is limited research has been done to investigate the heat stress effect on cow performance in a voluntary cow moving system. Uh, looking at this particular one, the Dookie Dairy, which is a cow vo voluntary moving system based on pasture feeding, uh, and how would that actually interact with the split calving system, uh, you know, overlaying the heat stress, we don't really know. So this is uh, what we want to, uh, you know, trying to investigate and understand the stage of lactation of the animal interaction with the heat stress. Uh, again, a bit of background information, the temperature humidity index known as THI, which is a heat stress indicator commonly used uh, for, to indicate how bad the animal could potentially suffer from the heat uh, stress. THI uh, in this particular case was calculated using the weather station data from uh, December 2016 to February 2017 and also uh, the second summer which is December 2017 to February 2018. We had the THI index calculated from the weather station data every 15 minutes. Lucky enough uh, Duki Dairy has got a split calving system uh, with early stage lactating animals uh, ranging from zero day to 100 days in milk and the mid stage of lactating animals uh, and also late stage of lactating animals. Therefore, that allowed us to be able to pr uh, perform this uh, analysis based on the robotic dairy data. 
So very quickly, the weather data that we had uh, uh, sourced from the weather station allowed us to calculate a daily average THI, and then we passed the data to the statistician, and he did a scatter plot and a broken line and a, a break points analysis basically allowed us to understand what is the interaction between the stage of lactation and the heat stress for that particular summer event. And we also sourced the milk data uh, as these are the more automatic milking systems. So really it's just a matter of extracting the data and regrouping the data. Uh, we were able to group the animals into heifer group and cow group. Part of that is because we want to understand how would the heifer group be different from the cow group, or maybe there's no difference. This is something that we want to explore as well. Then we combine them back as a cow herd. Uh, then we feed average milk production data and milk compilation data together with the weather data and try to understand the stage of lactation interaction with the heat stress. Lucky enough, uh, out of two summers, we were able to isolate three major heat stress events. Uh, in this particular case, we provided a few selection criteria here to uh, allow us to perform the analysis, which the criteria includes a baseline um, with no heat stress, which is THI less than 72. Uh, uh, so seven days baseline that we use as, as the uh, starting point. Then we found the heat stress event uh, for about three to four days, and that means the THI is more than 72. And after that, uh, the temperature uh, cools down, then we have a recovery phase, which is about seven days. In this particular case, that allowed us to understand how the actual heat stress event um, impact on the animal production and the performance, then whether or not the animal actually be able to recover from that particular heat stress event. Uh, the cows that we have from the heat stress one, two, three events uh, are listed down the bottom here. What you can see here is very much it's a, a spring calving system that uh, al allowed us to have the majority of cow the heifers coming from the meat lactating group. And we also managed to get some early lactating group, which are those cows that uh, calved in summer period, if you like. And then we also have some carryover cows that uh, uh, very much into the late lactating group, which are the cows actually calved in autumn period. So here are the results. And break that into three heat stress events uh, with uh, early, late, and mid lactating cows. Uh, anywhere between these two black bars uh, are indicating uh, the cow animals are having a, a the, uh, the THI is more than 72, uh, the animals are potentially suffering from the heat stress. So what we learned from this uh, studying is the cow reacted very differently at three phases, the baseline phase, heat stress phase, and the recovery phase. It probably doesn't surprise us. Um, and the significant reduction of milk production was also found in mid and late uh, groups, around about 10 to 15%, sometimes probably 20%, depending on which a particular animal we are looking at, but both group production actually recovered after the heat stress. In other words, the animal only really suffered around about three, four, five days. Then they were able to recover from that heat stress for those animals from the mid and late lactating groups. Uh, focusing on the heat stress event one, the first one, and you can see that the increasing rate for the early group in baseline was about 0.09 kilogram per day, and it was 0.03 kilogram per day in the recovery phase. So what does that really mean is the early stage lactating animal in heat stress event one, they did not lose milk, but they did lose their milk production potential even after the heat stress. In terms of the milk fat content and, and, um, and also the milk protein content, uh, milk composition wise, uh, the uh, result was not very consistent. So we know that the cow did not drop their milk production in the early group when suffer from the heat stress for a number of reasons, such as uh, because maybe because the catabolism of the body fat in the early stage cows were used to replace uh, deficit in the diet energy uh, intake, or 
perhaps these animals actually had a high efficiency by utilizing their body tissue reserve. And however, from the milk production potential, I um, bought these potential words here uh, very interestingly. Uh, what happened is the cows in the early group actually suffered more from the heat stress than the other group. We did a bit of additional analysis after this um, master uh, uh, degree thesis. Uh, what actually showed out is uh, the early lactating cows, those ones suffer from a heat stress, they did actually not manage to recover even after one month. So they did lose their milk production potential, if you like. Uh, milk composition, uh, very much uh, in line with the international literature. It uh, seems like the milk composition uh, uh, are not really uh, coordinated or consistent, uh, um, consistently impacted by the heat event. Uh, so I guess it's probably depending on how much milk the actual animal pr produce and also what they eat and also how they actually utilize what they eat. Uh, further analysis, we, we wanted to understand the cow versus the heifer uh, heat stress uh, 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 impact on them. So what we found is with a combined group, we found the THI uh, is actually 74, where for the heifer group, it's 78, which both of these values are uh, more than 72 that we previously used uh, from the international literature. Part of this reason probably is because the lower critical THI threshold for the milk production is 74 for the for the cow group compared with the heifer group, which is 78, because the heifers show less sensitivity to heat stress, which is probably mainly due to they produce less of the milk and try to utilize the body, uh, body uh, tissue reserve a bit better. So thank you. So thank you very much, Brendan and Paul, for your insightful presentation, both of you. Um, I've got one quick question for both of you, but you've got to be really quick with the answer. So the first question for Brendan is, do you think that the result of di the difference in result between cows and heifers means that we should al be allowing cows and heifers different access to pasture? So for example, allowing heifers earlier than cows, and in the meantime, I'll let Paul think about his answer. His question is, do you think AMS means we need to revisit THI indexes for dairy cows? So I'll go first with Brendan, if you're online. Yeah, thanks, Nico. Um, look, I, I, I do think there's a case for that um, in utilizing, you know, the the information that we get from an AMS system around that milking order um, to adjust um, access to pasture for, for different subgroups within the herd. So we've been doing a little bit of analysis around this in our virtual herding program, um, which is technology where you could potentially manage subgroups of herd or animals difference and a, a small increase in production associated with better access to pasture um, can be quite profitable, I think. Um, I'll stop there, otherwise I'll go on too long. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Brendan, for that one, but we can share your details and somebody might get in touch with you afterwards. Sure. So I'll now move on to Paul regarding the question of revisiting uh, THI index values. Yeah, I think, Nicole, there, there is a... Uh, there is a probably a need to, to relook at this for two reasons. The first one is because of a very moving system, which uh, the cows actually can choose where they go. For example, they can go to the shed uh, or they can be exposed, uh, uh, while they graze, uh, exposed to heat uh, while they graze on the pasture. So I think there's a bit of uh, potential that the cows can actually uh, try to reduce the heat stress by uh, manipulating their movement. The second one is a THI is an index that uh, built based on the temperature and humidity. It doesn't necessarily, particularly when it gets generated from the indoor starting, doesn't necessarily take into consideration of wind speed and solar radiation. Where our cows grazing outside, they are also suffering from this, or they could potentially benefit from the you know high wind speed uh, to reduce their heat load. Therefore, I think uh, there is probably uh, a, a reason why we should start uh, to look into this direction. Excellent. Thank you, Paul and Brendan, for your time um, and your insights. Uh, I appreciate very much you sharing that knowledge. 
Uh, sorry, I ran two, three minutes late, but I think there was really good information there. So thank you both of you for your time. Thank you, Nicole.